going to start right on time. Manuel, are you are you ready ready to go? Welcome everybody yes. to this yeah, perfect to this session. What really matters in higher education with Manuel Dolderer. Manuel, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you had a great morning and also for those who were able to join yesterday, uh, a great day yesterday. I had the pleasure of hosting a debate on well-defined versus ill-defined problems. Um, and we had a very fruitful discussion. And today um, I'm really grateful for the chance to, to talk to you about what I think, what we've learned uh, through the corona pandemic and our reaction to it. And it, for me, it has changed the way I look at universities and I look at higher education. And I want to present to you what a new perspective could be on the future of universities, given all the experiences we've had so far. I will try to stick to like 25 minutes. And so we have a couple of minutes in the end to talk about questions you might have. So if there's something you want to talk about towards the end, maybe just share it in the chat or um, keep it in mind. And um, at the end, you will have a chance to just share it with the audience, with everyone. And maybe we can have a quick discussion around a few points, uh, points and questions that might come up. Um, the question is, why is the talk in English? Um, it was presented in English um, because it was. I was told that it would be an international audience. So for me, the decision was to have an inclusive way of doing that because I expect everyone to be able to speak English, but maybe not everyone is able to speak German. Um, I hope everyone can understand me. Uh, so let me quickly share my screen with you so you can follow this more easily. Um, there's the share button. Here is my slides. Oh, I'm spoiling the most important message already. So now you could should be able to see just the black screen. Um, yeah, as I said initially, I think we need to rethink higher education. We've all gone through a phase where we made a lot of new experiences with what works and what doesn't work, uh, what doesn't work, not just in the situation of a pandemic, but in general, when it comes to our students learning in circumstances that we're not prepared for. And I, I think we can all admit that we weren't prepared. We are not prepared for these kinds of events hitting us, disrupting the way we are used to teaching and learning and organizing everything around teaching and learning. So I think that's the point where we need to start thinking about how higher education works. But for me, the more important aspect is not just that we as universities weren't prepared. It is also that our students were not prepared. And if I say they weren't prepared, I don't mean necessarily that they weren't prepared to, to learn from home, to use all these digital tools that we are relying on now, like, like Zoom or mural boards or other video conferencing tools, but they weren't prepared in a more profound way. They weren't prepared to be in charge of their own learning, to cope with this unexpected situation. And I think this is one of the things we have to look at it as universities as our mission to find out how we can do a better job at preparing our students for these kinds of events. Because what we're doing usually is we're training our students to work on well-defined problems that we're presenting them with in order to uh, see if they can apply certain methods and tools to create solutions. But if we look at the world out there, and that's not even just focused on the current pandemic, but in general, we see there's a lot of problems out there that are just not well defined. And this is just an example of a set of very, very important problems to solve. These are the 17 sustainable development goals uh, provided by the United Nations. And none of them are well defined in a way that it would be easy to understand the problem and apply a certain solution to it no poverty, zero hunger. These are ill-defined problems. These are hard to grasp. It's hard to find out where to even start working on a solution, let alone agree on a definition of what the actual problem is or how a good, good approach to solving the problem might look like. And But at the same time, I think we can all agree that we want our students to be prepared 
to address these kinds of problems, to start contributing to these kinds of challenges and maybe help make the world a better place when it comes to all these challenges that we see uh, as humanity. And one of the problems that we're facing as educators is that it's so difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And, and this is important because as educators, it's, it's basically our job to predict the future because we have to find out what our students need to learn today in order to be successful tomorrow. And with successful, I don't just mean to just get a job after graduating. Being successful in a world of tomorrow means being able to be a productive part of society, to understand what's going on around you. And this includes much more. And also to feel in charge, to feel like you are the one in charge of making your own decisions and designing your own life. This feeling of self-determinacy. And this is the hard part for us because figuring out what students need to learn today in order to be successful tomorrow requires us to make some predictions about the future, even though we can all agree, especially today, the future is very hard to predict. So the main question for me that universities should face is not how can we help our students become accountants or fill in the blank, put in any, any job that, that to, is, exists today. The main question for that should be a different one. The main question for me is how can we prepare our students for a VUCA world? And for those of you who haven't heard the, the abbreviation VUCA, it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I think we can all see how the world is influenced and shaped by these aspects that make it so hard to deal with it and that make it so unpredictable. And I put a fifth term in, in, in brackets here, that, which is technology, because I think we can't ignore the influences of technology on our society today and especially tomorrow. But we can also see today how technology can help us overcome certain challenges. Because right now we're able to host these, to have this conference and to meet and to discuss and to share thoughts and ideas because of technology. Because Corona prevents us from coming together as we would usually do, be in the same building and listen to each other being in the same room. Technology provides us with a solution, how we still be, how we're still able to do that. And the same goes, of course, for how schools and universities have been functioning over the last couple of months. Technology is, is able to provide solutions. It is basically a set of tools that can help us overcome challenges. But this also requires us and our students to understand these tools and not just understand in terms of being able to use them, but also understand their strengths and weaknesses. Um, also see the risks that we are accepting if we use these tools and especially what's happening behind the screen. So if we look at this kind of world what would it take for, for our students to be prepared? That is, I think, the main, questions, main question that we have to ask as a university today. So one way of approaching this could be to say the university of the future tries to make itself obsolete. And I don't mean that in the term, in the way that universities don't exist anymore. It means for our students. Maybe you can see this as you might look at it as a parent. As a parent educating your own children, your main goal is that your children have what it takes to get along without you. Because one day they will move out, they will leave, leave their own lives, and one day normally parents die and children survive and they keep on living. So they have to be able at some point in time to get along without their parents. And I think the same goal should be true for universities because we all know at some point our students will no longer be our students. They will be graduates, they will move on. And at that point, they have to be able to get along without us. And that I think should be a thought that it's not just relevant for graduates. It should be a thought that's important for the way we work with our students, we, we teach our students, um, and we interact with our students from day one. 
And it, the same thought is, let's empower our students to get along without us. One thing though we can't expect is to teach our students all the way until graduation in a very traditional way and then at some point expect them to all of a sudden just be able to switch into a different mindset and get along without us. This is a question of preparation. We have to prepare our students and this requires a different perspective on teaching and learning and the learning environment the future university should provide. And of course, it's not just these kinds of crises that hit us that we want our students to pre be prepared for. It is everyday life and the challenges that everyday life holds for every one of us. So that's the main question I want every university to ask. How can we empower our students to get along without us, to, to basically be prepared for this unpredictable future heavily impacted by, by technology and change and volatility and all the aspects that I've briefly talked about. One thing to, one way to look at this is to look at the mindset that students have when they leave university, when they graduate. And I came up or I, we developed a couple of aspects that this mindset should encompass, uh, incorporate and we called it the pioneer's mindset because being a pioneer for us is um, a perspective on the world that looks at new topics, that new, looks at new challenges, that looks at undiscovered aspects of the world and um, has and what it takes to, to figure things out, to go new, go new ways, to explore un, unbeaten paths. Um, that's why we've chosen the title, the pioneer's mindset. And what the pioneer's mindset um, entails is what I want to talk about in the next few minutes. The first aspect that belongs into the pioneer's mindset is a genuine curiosity. Because being curious about the world is really a main driver behind every learning, every successful learning, every sustainable learning. This is how we, how we discover the world when we're born. This is how we learn our mother tongue. This is how we learn how to stand, how to walk, how to ride a bicycle. All, as children, we are only driven by our own genuine curiosity. It is only when we enter school that someone else starts to, to tell us what to learn and, and when to learn it, and sometimes even why, why to learn it. But until then, it's only our curiosity that drives us. And, and if you look at it from a, from a broader, broader point of view, you could also say that most of, discover, most of the discoveries that were important for mankind have been driven by someone's curiosity or by chance, to be, to be honest, but also um, in, in many cases by just someone being very curious about something and not giving up until they've understood how it works, what it's all about, um, and how things depend um, are depending on each other. So this is something we need to kind of foster, to kindle in our students, because usually when they, when they come after 12 or 13 years of school, they don't really have access to their own curiosity anymore because over the course of their school career, no one has really asked them what, what they're curious about. But for a pioneer, this is a very important feature, I'd say. The next thing, and this goes closely with curiosity, is an eagerness to learn. And with eagerness to learn, I mean that learning needs to be not fun, but it needs to be a satisfying activity that needs to be something that you've understood. So students need to understand how learning works. They need to understand the psychology behind it, the neuroscience behind it. So it becomes a task that's, um, that's really fulfilling and gratifying. Usually if people graduate from high school or sometimes even from university, they're their first reaction is, whoa, I'm glad it's over. And this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be the reaction. The reaction should be, okay, what's next? What, what, what's next to learn? Because I think we can all agree, we have to keep learning throughout our lives. And if you want to explore new things, if you want this to be your mindset, then you should understand how you approach new things, how you can learn them, understand the science behind learning and develop this eagerness. Someone who's really looking forward to learning. The next aspect that is really important for a pioneer's mindset is empathy. And empathy, not just because it makes you an overall 
human being who's nice to be around. It is that empathy also makes you a better designer, a better teacher, a better product manager, a better leader. There's a lot of aspects where empathy is a very crucial quality to have. And it is also something that's hard to teach. I mean, if you just look at a module catalog of a traditional study program, you won't find a module on empathy because that's because you can't just teach empathy. So one of the main questions here would be, what kind of learning environment do we need to provide for our students so they have a chance to develop this quality? And I'll come to that um, in the last part of the presentation. Another thing that I think is very important, especially when we talk about the difference between the well-defined problems we train our students to solve in, in, um, in universities and schools and the ill-defined problems that we, that we face when we look at real life. So usually, um, if you look at 21st century skill sets, at this point, it says creative problem solving. I don't think that the solving part should be the main part. The main part is the problem discovery, the finding out what someone else's problem actually is, discovering the problem, understanding it deeply. So and you'll be able to define it. And based on this definition of a problem, you and others can start working on the solution. This requires different skills than just being able to solve a problem once someone else has defined the problem for you. But every time I look at entrepreneurs, I look at startup founders, I look at people who invent things, it's usually that they were able to spot a problem, to discover a problem that other people haven't dis hadn't discovered before. And at the same time, it's a problem that a lot of people have. This is what makes me buy a lot of things because someone created a solution for a problem I had, but I wasn't able to see the problem as a problem in a way that would allow me to create a solution for it. So creative problem discovery and problem solving should be a main aspect of this pioneer's mindset. And then because we all know that we won't be able to solve the world's problems on our own, we need collaboration and communication as skills. And this is, more easily said than done, because again, just offering a module or a course on collaboration communication won't help. It is something you have to do over and over again. You have to train, you have to reflect on, you have to find yourself in a situation where you are forced to collaborate and to communicate. And especially when it comes to diverse or international interdisciplinary teams. This is another thing that pioneers have to be able to do that we need our students to, to be prepared for, to collaborate and communicate in an efficient and effective way. And the next aspect is techno literacy. Techno literacy describing a basic understanding of technology, especially digital technologies that helps you make sense of what's going on in the world. Uh, I think we can all agree that technologies have a huge impact on our lives. I even say they have a much bigger impact that we that most of us are aware of. And this is where technology comes into play. And I think this is a quality that's important, whether you want to become a teacher or a carpenter or, or an accountant, doesn't matter. You have to have this technology to keep up with technological development and understand the influence technology has on our society. And then there's the entrepreneurial spirit, which doesn't mean that everyone, every student, every graduate should become a startup founder. It's more that you see yourself as someone who can make a difference, someone who has what it takes to create something, to influence something, to this idea of self-determination, that you can actually make a difference. And I think, again, this is something where we as universities have to ask ourselves, how do we provide an, an environment for that? Um, how do we provide students with the opportunity to experience themselves as entrepreneurs, as someone who can make a difference, as someone who can self-determine, uh, push things, create things, design things that, uh, that help others solve problems or are somehow useful. And the last thing uh, is critical judgment. Because it's not enough to just think critically about the world. You also have to be able to make a judgment, to come to a conclusion and to act on this conclusion while knowing that you won't ever have all the answers, that you will never find the truth but um, it's just not enough to think. You have to act on it at some point in time. Otherwise, it's hard for you to make a difference. That's why critical judgment um, is an important part of this pioneer's mindset. Though, 
if you look at all these aspects, you could probably agree it yeah, would be nice if our students had all that. Um, but how do we do that? How can we approach um, creating an environment that makes it easier, that makes it more likely for students to develop uh, these, these elements of a pioneer's mindset? And these are just some suggestions that I see that work for us um, at the environment we created at Code University and that others um, have already experienced as useful in their environments. Um, it's definitely not the answer to all the questions, but it's a way forward to think about how a university of the future might look like. And I think one of the very important aspects is self-directed learning self-directed where students are in charge to make decisions. Um, usually this is not the case because a lot of things already have been predetermined, have been planned, have been carved out, and the path is already clear for students to follow. Creating a situation where students can actually make decisions, be in charge of their own learning, uh, be self-driven, be faced with fuzzy problems and challenges that they need to define and, and, and configure this do, yeah, requires a different way of looking at teaching, but it gives students this feeling of, of self-determination and also lets students figure out what they actually want to learn and what they're curious about. And the self-directed learning goes hand in hand with project-based learning because projects are a very easy way to provide students with a chance to learn in a self-directed way. Projects are also a great way to connect your students with your environment. So let them connect with other institutions, with people outside university, so they can incorporate these experiences in their studies and not just have to wait until graduation to get in touch with real world problems. These, these projects, if they're real world problems, are usually also fuzzy and ill-defined. So they, they teach your students, our students, how to approach these ill-defined problems and make their own decisions on how they want to define these problems and how they want to approach them. And this could also be, a, this is a great preparation for, for research because research is basically the same thing on a higher level. So you can really lead students towards understanding and be eager to get involved with research using project-based learning uh, from an early stage on in their studies. Another thing that especially helps you become uh, a great collaborator and communicator is working together in teams. In, not just in teams with people who are very similar to yourself in terms of background and discipline and maybe even language, but in international and interdisciplinary teams that really challenge your ability to connect and communicate and collaborate. And by the way, also teach you a lot of empathy. It's important to incorporate that into a learning concept in a way that student, helps students reflect on how they're doing so they can understand what it takes to become a good learner, a good, a good co communicator and collaborator. So it needs to be really part of the curriculum and not just something that happens because you put a couple of people together in a room. It's something that has to be learned and it's something that needs um, supervision and, and uh, support from, from professors and, and faculty. And then, and this is probably one of the most challenging aspects, create a learning environment that is also an entrepreneurial environment where students can take initiative, where they can really create something, where, where they can give it a try, see how it feels to, to do something entrepreneurial and still knowing that if they fail, it doesn't hurt as much as it might in the real world. So it's still a safe place, but it's encouraging students to give it a try and hopefully develop this confidence that they have what it takes to make a difference. And last but not least, what we all need, I think, is a science, technology, and society program. I stole this from, from programs in Harvard and Stanford, but we this is a great way of describing that students need a place to reflect on the interdependencies between science, technology, and society, and especially the influence technology has on society. Because as I said before, similar to techno literacy, I think this is a quality that everyone needs, whether, no matter whether they want to become a scientist, uh, an engineer, or someone who work in social sciences. This is a quality that everyone needs to have to understand what happens with society and be an active part of, of a future society. So to sum up 
the university of the future for me finds a way to empower the pioneers of tomorrow to to provide a learning learning environment for students to develop the qualities that make up this pioneer's mindset that prepare them for the future and not just for a future to survive in but for a future that they will co-create, that they will co-design for a society that they play an active part in. And the good thing about this approach is if, if we're succeeding, then we don't have to predict the future anymore because we give our students the ability to invent the future, to, to invent the future together with others. And as Alan Kay put it so greatly, um, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Thank you. These are the thoughts I wanted to share with you. And uh, now I'm eager to hear your thoughts, comments. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure if you can, but I hope you can just unmute yourself and maybe um, let's use the last couple of minutes to, um, to hear what you think about this if you have different approaches, opinions, or just want to share your own thoughts. And thanks for the positive feedback. Can someone just quickly try if they can unmute themselves or do we do this about uh, using the chat? I think the uh, participants cannot unmute themselves, oh, okay. um, but you can raise your hand and we can make you a speaker if you would like to. I'll can, maybe I can just go quickly through through some of the comments uh, that have been uh, shared before. Um, the you to find a solution. Creativity, perseverance, entrepreneurial spirit, just talked about open-minded and fierce minded How can belief you provide these capabilities the best possible way? Um, there's one of the questions. On the matter of startups and going from problem statement to solution, are there not a lot of factors that are affecting a student's capabilities to find a solution. Yes, creativity, perseverance, the entrepreneurial spirit you just talked about, open-minded and a doer's mindset. How can you believe we provide these capabilities in the best possible way? Yeah, that's that's one of the one of the key questions. What does a learning environment look like that that allows students to to become creative, to to really let their own entrepreneurial spirit lose, so to say, and, and do something. I think this is um, a different way of thinking about a university environment than just thinking in terms of, of lectures and, and seminars and workshops. Um, it's probably a separate space that would be open for students to, to create something, to, um, to give some, yeah, to, to work together and, uh, I don't know, found an entrepreneurial adventure um, set up a startup doesn't even have to be a startup but just make something um and and see what happens and hopefully by doing so uh, gain confidence and th this is something you can actually do and this, it makes a difference and hopefully solves problems for you and other people um i tend to agree most of the principles are exactly those of american liberal arts colleges the real question how can that model be adapted to european german public universities which have more students and less resources. That's actually an, um, a very important point. Um, and, and we see this wherever, wherever professors talk about their experience with project-based learning and with creating these kinds of encouraging and empowering environments. This takes a lot of resources. This takes a lot of time and it's not an effective way to teach as it uh, compared, for example, with, with an introductory lecture uh, that's given to 500 students at the same at the same time. So this is definitely something we have to we have to look at closely to see where can we find the resources. How can we, uh, with the given resources that we have, shift the environments towards uh, this this kind of learning and this kind of empowering? Because it's definitely um, going to be um, it, it requires professors to be in closer touch with individual students and have more time for for individual students. That's definitely. Uh, definitely true. Same time, the talk is on high level as lecture in sense of learning facilitator. I think of a specific module about how to do it future forward, different levels of challenge. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to to talk about the the specifics and, and exchange experiences with with what we what we are doing at Coach University and what we saw other people doing. Um, this has been a high level talk, but um, I'd, I'd love to get involved with someone who's trying to break it down and see 
what can we actually do? What does it? What would it mean? What can I do differently tomorrow um, when when I'm trying to approach this? So if you, if you want to exchange ideas and, and thoughts, uh, just just get in touch. Um, preaching to the converted, yeah, that's that's often a problem. That's true. Um, pioneers issue resource. Um, how to get the spirit into an existing university? Yeah, that's that's of course a challenge. Um, and I've been talking about this with with university leaders and professors um, everywhere. It's probably a much bigger challenge than just found a new university from scratch. But at the same time, um, I we, I meet uh, so many so many professors and and uh, other people from existing universities that have this mindset and spirit and are looking for ways. So I think um, creating alliances and, and uh, alliances and, and Bringing these people together is probably a good first step. Uh, what do you do to help students understand psychology and neuroscience of learning on an empirical basis? We basically have a series of workshops on learning how to learn. Um, they don't go very deep in the theory, but they, they provide very hands-on things like um, uh, retrieval practice, um, metacognition, understanding how you can structure your own learning, um, what are good effective learning strategies and what are not. And for those students who want to understand the, the theory and the methods behind it, they, they get a chance. But for most students, it's a very hands-on approach and how to, how to become a more effective and efficient learner. Um, I'm afraid we're running out of time. We're already two minutes overdue. Um, so thanks everyone for the feedback. Um, and as I said, if you want to, um, if you want to talk about details, if you want to um, share insights and experiences, I'm happy to continue the conversation um, in the chat or um, somewhere else. You can. I'm just sharing my email here, but you can also find my profile um, in the in the app on the platform. And uh, please reach out. Happy to continue the conversation. Thank you, everyone.